Let me tell you a story of two people that I know, Lakshmi and Mahesh. Lakshmi was our caretaker in Delhi, a steadfast, always smiling woman. One day, after seeing her worried for a week, we sat with her and her husband to discover that they were close to losing their house. The problem was simple. Three years before, they put all their savings to build a house in Chennai when they owned a piece of land. They estimated the building to cost four lakhs, but because they didn't have any experience in project costing, the budget doubled, and they ended up borrowing from Loan Shark successively until their house was brought on stakes. Mahesh was a driver of a family friend in Delhi. After he knew that we were helping low-income dwellers to build their homes, he called us asking if he could visit his newly built home in the periphery of Delhi, to which we agreed. Unfortunately, after visiting his two-story unit, we came to the conclusion that the structure was so poorly built that the whole house could collapse in case of an earthquake. And we didn't have the heart to tell him. The story of Lakshmi and Mahesh could have been very different. They had access to professional help to estimate and build their house. Instead, they could only rely on the limited experience and knowledge of the local mason that usually come from the same socioeconomic background. This is a situation for millions of people in India, and especially of that living in an informal area like this. These are four different locations in Delhi. What they have in common, they are not part of the formal city. As you can see, the, the level of construction and the characteristics of this location are quite different, and it is usual the legal status or level of informality that determine the building condition. The better the legal status, the more permanent are the structure and the tendency to go vertical. These locations are usually called slum. However, let me tell you, I don't like the word slum. How can we put together location and buildings so different and dismiss them with this one word, slum? I will refrain to call this spontaneous part of the city slum, and instead I will call them informal colonies or informal settlements, and instead to consider them as a problem, I invite you to see them as a solution or, well, at least a prototype, since they need to be improved. Consider this. In India, you have a housing deficit of around 20 million. It doesn't mean that 100 million people are living on the street. The majority of them are living in this informal settlement. They found a solution to the lack of housing that the government and the formal economy couldn't fix. Informal settlements also share some positive. They are often bursting economy. Think about the Ravi. Their community has strong, strong social structures, and they are often very effective. They consume a fraction of the land and the resources that the formal part of the city does. I don't want to romanticize informal settlement. Uh, this is very important to say. I know what are the living conditions in the majority of them. There are many problems that need to be solved, aside the main one related to legal rights and access to basic infrastructure, there is the fact that architects and engineers are not there to help informal dwellers, people like Lakshmi and Mahesh. The reason is they see them as an unworn client segment living in an unregulated context where there are no building approval or construction process in place to guarantee the quality and safety of housing. So, informal housing is affordable, but unfortunately, in its majority, poorly built. And as a result, informal settlement has an extremely low resilience to natural hazard, like floods or earthquakes. As an architect, I found incredible that millions of people today, in India and other countries, are building their home alone without any support and there are almost no system in place to fix this problem. Since 2009, when with Rakimera we started our group, our work focused on how to bridge the socioeconomic gap between construction professionals and low-income communities. We wanted to democratize the access to this service so that everyone could have the opportunity and the right to live in a safer and healthier unit. During the last nine years working in informal settlement, we made two important discoveries. First, we learned that when low-lying dwellers can experience the support of an architect or an engineer, 
They tend to value it, and they are even willing to pay for it. Second, we know that it's enough to provide simple inputs to dramatically improve the quality and safety of the units, usually within the same budget. This is very important to understand. Low-income dwellers don't build poor and weak structures because they want to save money. It's because of lack of knowledge. So the kind of support we give, as I was saying, is not that of a typical architect. We provide basic info on quantity, cost, and key instruction on how to build. This can make a difference. By providing the correct inputs on the structural side, gross mistakes that could compromise the safety of the unit could be avoided. By providing the correct design inputs, parameters like hygiene, light and ventilation could be improved, and so the life of the people that live in these units. So, what we wanted to do in the past year has been how to bring this kind of support to everyone in a feasible and scalable way. The challenge we faced were the lack of professional and the cost of delivery. So we rely on technology and the opportunity to leverage the penetration of a mobile connected platform. What we wanted to do was to build a magic book, a kind of manual that could open on the page with the exact information that Lakshmi or Mahesh need, and that the information could be passed to them in a form they could understand, to help them in the phase before and during construction. Imagine a kind of IKEA manual for their specific project. So we coded a large number of engineering drawing and architectural design, and then we put together in a responsive system. This way, Lakshmi or Mahesh could now say, I would like to build a 7 by 10 meter house, house two story high, with tiles on the facade and two bathrooms. And the system, knowing the location, and so the seismic zone and the cost of material and labor for the area, return the project data for the specific project. The book open on the exact page. These are some uh, graphics coming from our system. This is an overall cost uh, with a split for each floor. And the system further, as you can see, uh, create a list of all the material, quantity, and cost for each level. It also indicates the cost of labor and generate a timeline for construction to guide them again during the edification. Engineering data combined with the, with the graphic can also provide inputs on how to build. By this, Mahesh could know that his house requires nine columns and that the nine columns need to be built with this size and with this kind of reinforcement. The information can be collected via mobile device by taking a picture of a paper with the inputs or by voice command, obviously in the language of the region where it is used. And the result can be printed or shared by email, WhatsApp, or again by audio. And this is where we are at now. Now we know that this is not enough. It's not enough to provide the inputs to people so that their house will become better. It's not enough to provide inputs so that people will follow them. But at least, by using technology, we can make sure that this opportunity is there. And then we can work together to create awareness and find the correct incentive for low-income communities to build better. There are also various stakeholders in the incremental housing sector that could help with this. Think about financial institutions. They are already offering to this segment of the population housing loan. What if the same officer that is approving a loan could pass his or her client a set of information for this specific project? Material company could provide the same set of data to their customer, maybe in their shop. Or the government could use project data to implement and monitor housing policy and ensure that the basic standard in construction will be met. Skill development agencies that are training construction labor and mason could equip them with a set of always update digital tools they could always refer, even after the training is done. Moreover, we see the opportunity to create a set of community architects, people that empowered by technology could go around and help communities to plan and build better. The same way community health workers and paralegal are supporting the healthcare and the legal system, we imagine this intermediate layer of technician to be able to bridge the gap between community and professional. I like to think of them as midwife of architects. 
In conclusion, we know that in 20 years, there will be more people forced to live in informal settlement. While we need to design and implement policies to invert this trend, we can at least start to provide design to everyone, to people already know in need of design and technical aid. We see a close future where Lakshmi could go in a cement store or in a bank and get the exact estimation for her building. Or when Mahesh can build his house by looking at an instruction he can get on his mobile phone. If we manage to impact the quality and safety of informal housing, we can improve the resilience of informal settlement, one house at a time. Thank you.